So this is exactly what we have here, XG Boost, and you will probably be seeing them dominating through all of the Kaggle challenges and all data science challenges that you currently see as of date. All of them use Kaggle, probably. Uh, sorry, all of them use XGB Boost almost extensively. Currently, any as of date, just go and check for any of the machine learning challenges, and you would see them that all of them use XGB Boost for assembling, and that kind of makes sense because it's you can clearly understand the fact that it's something that gives you extremely good performance, right? Gradient boosting, as we saw, was something that is that is optimized for making things better, right? What better can you have than having a model which first gives you error, and then you train successive models which kind of tries to predict that error itself. Combine them, you have something that even if you're one of your model, right? One of your last prediction model for error works absolutely fine. You would be having a very awesome time, right? So that's exactly why XGB Boost and GB Boost is very popular. So, uh, that's uh, this, the thing is this is implemented with the uh, use of an external library the external library called XGB boost it's not part of your SKL uh, that's because obviously this library in turn implements a lot of uh, performance optimizations we are kind of gonna see some of those yeah so out of core op out of core computing and cache optimization so these are some of the things that XGB guys use you don't need to completely understand all of it to understand how they have optimized for performance the thing to understand this is there are a lot of small engineering tricks and gimmicks which has led to XGB boost working absolutely phenomenally better than the SKL and GB boost as of day and that's why we see that XGB boost is something that is extremely popular in industry as well as for all data science challenges uh, academia, almost anywhere your XGB boost is definitely something people are uh, using extensively. And uh, you, can you can clearly see through this graph, these are different implementations. Uh, this is different implementations of uh, GB boost across multiple libraries. And you can see here that this uh, on the left axis, on the Y axis, you have the time, and y X axis, you have the number of iterations. And you clearly see this line. This is the pink line, which is performing really great, right? So it's the XGB boost, which almost takes the least amount of time for any given iteration, almost. So the implementation is frankly as simple as SQL, so there's nothing much in here. Uh, so all you had to do is just for import first install this library XGB boost, and from XGB boost you have got to import this classifier XGB classifier. So then you do the same consequential next step, which is splitting into trend and test. So you do the same thing. And then after that, the same thing, right? So you just first, in first initialize a class model and then use that to do fitting, right? So, and now our prediction, it works exactly like this. So prediction is nothing but model.predict and that's exactly the same to SKLearn, right? So now you can see the accuracy score for the same. The accuracy score is something that you are using it from the SQL and you don't need to use XGB Boost. XGB Boost is just for the implementation of that algorithm gradient boosting, but at a much more optimized speed. That's what XGB Boost is. So all of this you can anyways do using SQL and that's what we... So obviously there's a concept of saving and training model. I think we have not talked about it enough. But in real life scenarios in production, you cannot be obviously be running your model on a Jupyter notebook and kind of, you know, waiting for new predictions to come in and run them on a Jupyter notebook and put them back, right? So what you need to do for any particular case, this is not specific to XGB Boost. This is kind of applicable through entire machine learning domain, whichever algorithm you're using. Uh, the way it works is you kind of do this rough calculations. You could be doing it in Jupyter notebook. You could be doing it in Python scripts. But the whole thing is you basically first train your models and then you kind of store them in some location, right? And while prediction, while test time on a real life scenario when the data is coming in, you just load that saved model, right? You're not gonna retrain every time you have to predict, right? That's not obviously feasible. So that's what we are doing here. So we are gonna save our model uh, using a pickle. So pickle is nothing but a way to kind of store all your Python data structures and everything that you would want to store. Uh, in a pickled format and that's it so we first do pickle.dump the model and in the next end when we want to load it we can just load it model equals to pickle.load and it works as as simple as that now like because obviously XGB boost is an implementation of decision trees at the end like decision tree obviously it has feature importance so as much like random for random forest was also an ensemble of decision tree and around random also random ensemble also gave us 
feature importance is. Similarly, XGB Boost is also an implementation of assembling of decision tree. So obviously it would also have the feature importance is. So in this case alone data side, you can clearly see applicant income is the most important feature. This is again something that if you can go back and check using random forest, you would probably find the same result. If you use random forest on the same data set, try and fit it and then see the feature importance, probably you'll get the same thing. And now there's a final concept that we wanted to kind of talk about in early stopping, which is basically that if you're training your model for multiple iterations, then uh, you know at every iteration of a gradient descent, you basically see if your model is performing well or not. And because these are very computationally expensive algorithm, it kind of makes sense for you to kind of uh, you know not do the entire costly evaluation throughout the entire 200 or 300 iterations. So what you do is at every iteration, you're gonna check for if your model is performing well or not. And based on that, you're gonna stop your model if your model has not been say, successively performing good for 10 rounds or 10 iterations basically. So if your model is not performing very well for 10 iterations, you can completely stop the model then and there. And so that you don't need to you know, completely do the all possible iterations, all set of iterations because that's computationally expensive, right? So like same, same as GBM in XKLR, uh, XGB Boost also has parameters which are specific to this. So there's nothing more absolutely. So the implementation wise, the parameters, hyperparameter wise, it's exactly same as the scalar and GB Boost. The only thing to, the only thing that is awesome out here is basically this whole computation time, right? That computation time has been reduced extremely uh, by, a, by a huge extent, I would really say that. that this is really a something that we, Everyone of us who are using HGB Boost are really thankful for this is really cutting down time in real life scenarios and this particular thing is nothing different from gradient boosting. It's just that the speed and all of those optimizations for computations that has been done here. And the final note which I kind of want to end this lecture on is basically this very famous quote which is great power comes great responsibilities. As you can see HGB Boost is extremely awesome. Uh, it performs XGB boost as in the whole algorithm of boosting and specifically gradient boosting is extremely awesome. If you give our data, it would definitely fit something very accurately of your training data very quickly, right? So given that is the understanding, uh, obviously with that kind of comes its cost, which is basically it's extremely prone to overfitting, right? Because it trains, it fits a model very quickly and very accurately to your training data. That means it's very prone to overfitting, right? So you have to be very, very careful about that overfitting fact. You don't want to kind of end up with models which are overfitted XGB boost models because uh, it, at the end of that, it would not generalize well, even if it fits very well on your training data. And the second thing, which is not exactly written here, but something I really want to talk about is XGB boost and probably for that matter, all of ensembling is really good techniques. These are really good. These are really great techniques, awesome techniques, fabulous. But one thing to keep in mind is these are the techniques which get you from 84.6% accuracy to say 85.6%. But for you to kind of get to the place where you can have 84.6% accuracy, you need to do all of your feature engineering and everything that goes around data pre-processing, data cleaning, thinking about different features. All of those thoughts need to still go behind. These are basically the XGB boost and all of these are techniques which basically kind of stretch your final level, final mile performance, right? So you go from 85.6, either the slight 1%, slight 5.5% increase in accuracy, all of that kind of comes in from this. But for to get you to 84%, you still probably need to use your decision trees and all of those to kind of see how, if you can still get to 84. If you can get to 84% using normal decision tree and all of that, you would definitely benefit from using XGB Boost. But obviously if your decision tree only is giving you say 60% AUC or something like that, even after using XGB Boost, you really cannot go a lot because you have not really done that whole pre-processing thing very rigorously. So just because there's something which is absolutely phenomenal doesn't mean you can directly use it as it is off the shelf and kind of expect to have results. You would still need to do your data pre-processing feature engineering because at the end of the day, this library is available to everyone. What you do with the data, how you play around with it kind of defines how your model is going to perform at the end of the day. So that's about it. So again, kind of recapping the entire lecture. One is what is boosting? Boosting is nothing but the idea of combining a lot of weak learners into a strong learner. That is the whole concept of ensembling. Now, how do you do that? You have multiple models that you train sequentially. Each model basically making sure that the errors of the previous model have been corrected for. You train your first model M1. It makes some errors, 
your M2 comes in, says that, okay, I'm going to correct for the errors of M1. M3 comes in and it says I'm going to correct for the errors of M2. And that's the sequence that you kind of built up and that's the whole concept of boosting. Now there are obviously two things that kind of happens here, ADA boost and gradient boosting. ADA boost was basically where you see the model where each of the data points where it went wrong and based on the error of each of those data points you give weightages. Such that your second model makes sure that the high weighted, highly weighted points are not the ones it makes an error once. And so it makes sure you're, you're kind of predicting your second model is predicting very accurately for the data points which have high weights. That was the concept of ADA boost. In case of gradient boost, what happened was something else. We had a model, we tried predicting the values and then there was an error with those, right? So in second step, what you do is try and predict the error itself, right? Fantastic idea. Try and predict the error itself. In the third case, in the third model, what it would do, it would basically say that, okay, second model tried predicting the error, but there is still some error in the error prediction. So your third model comes in and says that, hey, I'm going to predict error of errors, right? So now you combine M1, M2, M3, right? The actual prediction, the error prediction, and the error of error. You have something which is fantastic and very, very, very strong method. You can clearly understand. This is a, this is a scientific way you are kind of building your multiple models. The only problem with boosting and all of them as such is that uh, these are all sequential models, right? So that means they cannot be parallelized like the way we did for random forest. In random forest, it was pretty easy, but in XGB boost, you cannot do that. So what you have to do is you have to kind of resort to some more computational gimmicks. That is exactly what XGB boost is. Engineering techniques designed to make the performance much better for you. Uh, the same algorithm, the same concept, everything remains the same. Only optimization, computation optimization that kind of leads to much better performance in terms of time and speed uh, for gradient boosting. That's exactly the library XGB Boost is all about. And I've probably talked enough about all the lectures that if these are all methods which are extremely awesome, but at the same time, they're prone to overfitting. So please keep in mind if you're trying to train these things uh, you have to be very, very careful about the overfitting bit. So use hyper tuning wisely and efficiently, and you probably would have something that works perfectly on Kaggle challenges. So best of luck for that. And I hope to see you next lecture. Uh, again, thank you. Thanks a lot. Log on to Gray Atoms learning platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.